Kill Zone and Granada for the Sega Genesis circa 1990 by the ill fated renovation care of Telenet in association with Wolf Team, aka Namco Tail Studios today, and both of which originated on the Sharp X68000 before being ported to said system, aka the Mega Drive. Before I proceed with this latest two-part review, I'd like to take this window of opportunity and dedicate this to David Giltonen from another Retro Gaming Podcast, or ARG Cast for short, Mike Tando Levy and Ed Wilson from Pixel Tunes Radio, Aaron Hickman aka Daya from San Antonio, Donut Shoes to Sadiel, Tryheart that is Diamond Machine, Biffle Cup and Astrologic, Pete Hegarty aka Robot Sex Music, Eric Brown aka Rainbow Dragon Eyes, Dave White and Joe Redifer from GameSack, Geekbeat Radio that is Borealic, Solomon, Ogung Badero and others, Joe Space Kappa Walker and both his wife and daughter. Christina and Isabel, respectively. Ian Bergeson, care of 16 bit heroes in the offseason. Bit Bar Salem. Sarah Huber from Valari's Martial Arts in Westboro. Alongside her better half, Jamie Clock. Adrian Ardvark, Nova One featuring Roz Raskin. Dewey the Band. Taylor Holland. Eleanor Electra. Maggie Rosenberg. Perennial. The Bummer City Historical Society. DIY The Show. Boston Open Screen that is Healy, Van Voorhees, and Atwood. Alicia Jean Orsini Labita from Women and Film and Video New England. Rental Floss. Pat Country, The NES Punk. The Library Bards. 8 Bit Eric. The Vidari String Corps. Quartet, Lame Genie, and finally, Saru Studio of Henshin Engine fame. With these out of our system, on to Final Zone's main premise. Set approximately a century into the future, presumably 2090, during which all weapons of mass destruction, or WMDs for short, are expressly prohibited from all war fields. All fights are managed with the use of mechanical armor suits, referred to as NAP suits or New Age Power suits. An ambitious, heroic soldier of the prosperous El Shariah Military Nation's Foreign Legion, namely Howard Bowie, member of the unit Team Undead, who, as I like to point out, is in no way, shape, or form related to the late Ziggy Stardust, aka Goblin King Jareth, is assigned to execute the use of his special K-19 Phantom Nap suit and obliterate the last remaining WMD on the planet, whilst infiltrating and eradicating all enemy territories through points A-46K, hence Bloody Axis. <laughs> Regarding the gameplay, it's an isometric mech-based scrolling run and gun, aka what I like to call the bastard child of Target Earth and Solstice, within which you're tasked with destroying every key target in sight, whilst experimenting with different weapons. They're composed of differentiating WMDs, running the gamut from floating tanks referred to as scorpions, hovering cannon crafts known as flies, attack choppers referred to as hornets, mechanical walkers known as golems, again has jack shit to do with Pokemon, other opposing New Age power suits, otherwise referred to as wolves, hence the developer's namesake, and rotating turrets referred to as batteries, to name several, not counting the minor walking droids. Control-wise, the standard D-pad migrates your suit and manages its aim in one of eight possible directions, or just tap any of the eight twice to make your suit dash for a moment, and by default, A, B, and or C depending on your customization beforehand, fires off both its primary and secondary weapons, and accesses your weapons menu, within which you can swap said weapon types at will, individually. And regarding the former two commands, you can actually strafe while attacking, Concerning the weapons, while your K-19 Phantom Nap suit starts off with your standard machine gun, which isn't limited for the record, the rest of the arsenal depends on how much energy you've got remaining, 14 out of a possible 20 to be precise, of which your suit is capable of occupying by obtaining energy transports, all ranging from a shotgun, wave projectiles, a bazooka, ray, grenades, a wire, what have you. Should you happen to take damage at any point, however, they're lost instantly, thereby readjusting yourself back to the lowest priority armaments, depending on the order of the Nap's body parts within which they're housed. In the case of each and every stage, upon taking out the requisite number of adversaries, a boss altercation thus takes place, featuring the following. First, there's the Great Bull, a convoy of rail cars containing green battery turrets and walkers, the Black Knights, a trio of black and golden elite mecha suits that unload a shit ton of mines whilst constantly strafing in a circular 360 degree motion, the Twin Eagle, not to be confused with the ROM star Taito Seta shmup, a duel of orange mecha suits that strafe around in a square motion while also unloading mines, thus not only increasing their speed during each revolution, but also firing off their three way spread flamethrowers, a floating near arachnid like mech armed with lasers, hence the oddly named Spiderweb, the Molehill, a highly advanced defense area engineered to the brim with rotating turrets, more of those horrendous mines and its main core, the Axis supercomputer guarded by heavy defenses, I mean goddamn mother brain would be so fucking proud, and last but definitely not least, the final battle during which another rogue wolf nap suit pursues you while you are attempting to escape the fucking Axis base, and trust me when I say this, they will all make you their eternal bitch every step of the way, likewise with the major target WMDs, hence what the manual refers to as the officer enemies, if your cyber combat tactics aren't at full readiness. 
If and when your mech eventually reaches critical status, parts of the screen will flash red, as will your mech suit, until either said suit A replenishes its health and weapon supplies, or B gets totaled to ABSOLUTE SHIT FUCKING ALL DUE TO EXCESSIVE ASS FIELD DAMAGE! Should the latter outcome occur, it's an instant game over, hence the destruction cutscene against the moonlit background, at which point you're provided either 1, 3, or 5 continues depending on which mode you're playing on — hard, normal, or easy, respectively. However, the next operation takes effect should you manage to subjugate each area boss, and then it's wash, rinse, repeat, yada yada. we all know where the hell all that's going. <laughs> As irksome and overplayed as the gameplay framework is, mostly due to the high chance of coming across each minor enemy whilst dealing with the mandatory officer enemy targets, in stark intertwinement with the unfathomable, continuous looping warfield foregrounds, hence why the dashing ability is key for ignoring their pathetic asses. But then again, it depends on the fluctuation speed, but I digress. Either way, it's actually not that much of an absolute buzzkill, and nor is the semi-convoluted control setup and quality. Regarding Final Zone's challenge, even taking what I laid out into consideration, I wouldn't even go so far as to jump into Final Zone expecting any casual, cutesy leisure moments, let alone a slight pretense of mercy at any point whatsoever. Seriously, this fucking game will, paraphrasing Sexy Beast, cut your hands off and use them as ashtrays, and whenever you're done toking it up, it'll put out your roach, cigar, or cigarette of choice, provided you've prepared to let it stub said roach or cigar or cigarette the Christ out. For the sake of going out on a limb, I had absolutely no concise idea what the hell I was getting myself into when I first experimented with Final Zone, but after at least getting past the first two cakewalkish missions, my gentle Jesus what a distant galaxy of giraffe shits into which I've spiraled myself. Getting back to the preliminary Phase A operations, precisely those entailing the total extermination of all the main targets, other than the minor, pointless cannon fodder walking droids, there's all kinds of shit to be wary of, most notably the shadows of the bomber planes, which will flat out cut your ass down like Kenshin fucking Kimura, aka Batosai the Manslayer. In other words, you'll probably reach near death should you happen to be within their proximity, not to mention all the counter offenses of the target enemies and main area bosses, and even the chances of colliding into any unsuspecting adversary if your suit makes a pointless dash at the most inopportune junctures, therefore I'm willfully implementing a few pointers for everyone to bear in mind. Equip at least one of the higher priority weapons, even before reaching the main boss altercations. Have the targets approach you, at which point the familiar as fuck old saying comes into play, shoot first, ask questions later, and most importantly, evade deliberately as often as possible should any chaotic, intense offenses manifest themselves within your mists. On the extreme ladder, I cannot stress enough more than anything. Need I remind everyone yet again to refer back to the continued limitations dependent on the difficulty setting, which, regardless of which mode you experiment with, the game's at least halfway tolerable? Graphically, for an early 16-bit title from roughly three decades ago, the three-quarter isometric view of each landscape and opposing groups of subjects, namely all the mech suits, the choppers, the weapons of mass destruction and the like, aren't too goddamn shabby. There are hints of shading, highlights, and shadowing on everything, including Howard's own K-19 Phantom Nap suit and most of the multicolored Axis adversaries, notwithstanding how dated, overplayed, and ambiguous the animations and palette swaps are, with the exception of the tanks and rotating cannons. Also, notice how your desired weapons shift along with the overall movement of the Phantom Nap suit while it attacks. Regarding the landscape foreground designs, while granted, they loop over and over no matter how far you travel, except maybe in the military base interiors, at least the appearances of the opposing adversaries are offset by the variety of said landscape foregrounds. All in all, while Wolf Team wasn't well versed enough in delivering the best possible visual quality overall, it's at least tasteful and sufficient for the time this was released. As far as music and sound, orchestrated by Wolf Team's own Sergeant Wolf Band, made up of Motoi Sakuraba, Masaki Uno, and Yasunori Shiono, despite the latter being excluded for this particular Genesis port, likewise with the soon-to-be-discussed Granada, the former of Soul Feast, aka Soul Deese on Genesis, Time Gal, Revenge of the Ninja, aka Ninja Hayate, and Road Avenger, El Viento, Ernest Evans, and later the Tales franchise for Namco, you know, Fantasia, Symphonia, all that shit, hence the ill-fated Wolf Team's new name, not to mention Beyond the Beyond by Sony and Camelot, Star Ocean, Shining the Holy Ark, and even From Software's Dark Souls and Demon Souls. The variety of themes are on about the same wavelength as the graphics. While they're a mixed bag, not that most of them are an ERA Bally, at least a few of them are tolerable, despite the fact that their percussion capabilities are beyond lacking compared to other early Genesis titles, including Shadow Dancer, ESWAT, Target Earth, Gyrus, and of course the earlier sighted yet soon to be analyzed Granada. 
The sound effects aren't much of a grating nightmare either, though they tend to clash with each other time and time again, no pun intended. That is, all the explosions, gunfire, bombers hovering overhead, and that one gets cut off after another, thus introducing an ingredient for a most distracting experience. If you need to, take note of my top 6 songs shown here, considering there aren't much to feature anyway. <laughs> While, to be blunt, there's not very much in the way of replay value, taking most of the common issues into consideration, some of which I've laid down, including but not limited to, the control's half-assed attributes, the random fluctuation speed of the in-game confrontations, and god forbid the unnatural, hair-raising difficulty stemming from the former two gripes I might add. There's no doubt in my mind that you'll be strapping time and again into the dramatic and intense wars of Wolf Team's Final Zone. <laughs> Exhibit B, Granada. wise sometime in the fall of 2016, literally almost two years ago, once again taking this game's age into consideration, a private Enterprise soldier by the name of Leon Toto, one of the last known and vastly experienced sharpshooters I might add, receives a floppy disk via contact from a female private Enterprise's intelligence department agent containing a job request. While an all-out civil war breaks out in Africa over the interest of exceedingly rare metals, which were gradually intensified by a new breed of tactical maneuver weapons introduced on account of a shitload of long-range nukes, namely the maneuver scepters. Long after the outbreak of the so-called African Civil War, it further presented itself in the form of frontline abnormality thanks largely to the destruction of these all-new weapons from unknown territories of origin on both north and south flanks by various heavy mobile tanks, one bearing a commonly known code name, that of the titular hypercannon tank Granada. Ever since the dawn of its existence, it's been referred to as God of Africa and even Ghost of the Soldier, hence that earlier referenced mission request. Upon hearing news involving that very same agent who sent it to Toto, in terms of her eventual death by a mysterious cadre of adversaries, he wastes no valuable time hauling ass for Japan a month in advance and thus boarding the unstoppable maneuver scepter Granada into the rip-roaring wild with not only a sneaking suspicion, hence why many deceive him, but with a sole, unbreakable purpose. Retribution towards any and all that dare to oppose the strong-willed motherfucker. Gameplay-wise, it's an overhead top-view tank shmup in which, as if it's not obvious already, you're tasked with eliminating any and all targets before confronting and overpowering the main stage boss in each area within a provided time frame akin to Namco Bandai's Battle City and Atlas and Asuka Technologies' Cosmo Tank. These range from tank bases, aircraft engines, spacecrafts, reactors, hypertanks, stations housing said hypertanks, cannons, and the like, indicated by the red dots on your provided bottom right radar, while the blinking dot is your main area target boss. Christ, Ranger X much? Control-wise, in conjunction with the D-pad for multi-directional navigation and rotation, the latter of whose speed can be changed in the options menu beforehand, A fires off your main tank's normal cannon, B lets your tank strafe while having its cannon locked in one of the 16 possible specific directions, and C unleashes a high-pulse energy blaster beam for more advanced defensive capabilities, which, not surprisingly, is unlimited. Depending on which difficulty mode you've also set beforehand, Granada's energy meter ranges from short to long, and should the tank happen to expose itself to way too much mutilation, it'll eventually explode to fuck all, thereby resulting in an instant life loss. Ditto if you cause the tank to slip off any high structure and thus making it plummet to its chaotic demise. In addition, depending on which stage you're raising all kinds of hell in, there's nine by the way, there's a sparse yet fair variety of weapons you'll be experimenting with, the most common of which being the reflectors, rotating option cubes that supply the same level of firepower, reminiscent of Konami's Gradius franchise, or even Sega's Alien Syndrome, which reflect off if they hit any walls. Others include heat-seeking missile cannons referred to as epaulets, four of which your tank can equip, a disc-like shield which unleashes a shit ton of firepower when launched, oddly referred to as the Paul Vanyan or Paul Bunyan for some reason. <laughs> Like, seriously, Wolf Team? And even the rotating interceptor orb, referred to as the Chromelech, for added attack and defense, which only works while the tank's firing away, if possibly shit all else. Plus, a rare hidden fan like accessory which massively detonates. 
Take note, upon clearance of any stage area, these weapons don't carry over to the next mission, in which case you're better off with what each of them offer, and there aren't any vitality or life refills here unlike in Final Zone. Granted, it can be a major crush-forsaken drag to many, but as I've grown to comply to the bullshit restrictions of both this game and Final Zone, they don't faze me in the least. Oh fucking shit, no. Getting back to the central 9th stage itinerary of battlefields, as well as the bosses you'll be defying upon neutralizing the required number of targets, they all range from cityscapes atop the flying a starship battleship, within a dark, deserted, almost underground cavern like district, mountain sites, heavily guarded cliffs, a volcanic area, and finally the private enterprise's enemy HQ. And regarding the latter, there's a gigantic purple and red hopping dynamo, a twin cannon armed rotating attack ship whose weak point is visible when you're not using your tank's normal cannon shots. In which case, stick to the fucking high pulse blast! an assortment of various attack ships, tanks, boats, vans, what have us, which take way more firepower than necessary, including the craft in Stage 4 that summons mines, whose weak point can be reached if you fire off the normal cannon shots and have them reflect off the walls, and avoiding the giant crevice in the center above which said craft hovers, a massive stone-crafted base with four exploding needle turrets, which in turn unearths the multi-segmented golden centipede upon its destruction, and finally, a fierce, mobile, not-to-be-fucked-with aircraft-like mech, whose only methods of assault are its group of backup needle-nosed crafts and other immeasurable types of firepower, making even the Zakus, Galgooks, and all the Evangelion Angels, Adam, Lilith, no goddammit, not that Lilith, Sachio, Shamshio, Sahakwil, and others, look like Rock'em Sock'em's made of goddamn broken down Lego and Kinex pieces. While the first three confrontations are a walk in the park, provided you've gotten to them at least barely unscathed, the latter six will all but guarantee your ass doesn't live long enough or get far enough. And might I add that they'll chop off your wedding tackle, deep fry and fricassee the ever loving shit out of them, and serve them right back to you on a damn bronze platter? Upon the defeat of each of the cold hearted hypertech hard asses, however, another mission ensues where the procedure repeats itself and so forth. Notwithstanding how flawless the control framework and gameplay aspects are, in tandem with their respective strategic elements, hence the focus of our next subject, it could be a massive pain in the scrotum to get the hang of any and all deliberate evasion tactics, especially while trying to curtail the chances of exposing the tank to various hazards, including but not limited to the prolonging, lingering explosions caused by certain hazards that'll cause a savage infliction upon it. But all in all, they're still convenient to tolerate through and through. In stark, distinct comparison to Final Zone, Granada's on about the same level of difficulty and challenge rolled into one, mostly in terms of how wide or narrow your tank's vitality is depending on which mode you're playing on, as I established not too long ago. More than that, the chances of getting lost in a few of the later stages are god knows how many to one, despite having that aforementioned bottom right radar map provided in each stage, which not only displays the main bosses and requisite targets to be ravaged, but also the location of your own tank, hence the white dot. Take the fourth stage, for instance. Although there's a surrounding light on Granada within that very same darkened, cavern like district area, there's all types of shit to watch out for, aside from the great colored target hypertech tanks, most notably the semi destructible boulders that roll around when you're in their vicinity and can almost mutilate the ever loving piss out of your attack vessel, in which case, stay back until it's safe enough to migrate past. And don't even get me motherfucking started with the final three stages either, some of which involve exploding needles that'll damn near muff up your tank, or even worse, attack vehicles that They'll slide it right off the structure, thereby making you their eternal bitch in hell! Also, expect to engage in a lot of tedious, soul crushing, insanity raping, maze maneuvering treks, and torrid, excessive dogfights, even in the fifth stage and onward, no less, not just against the requisite targets and/or minor adversaries, or the main stage bosses as well, the latter of which can be drastic and time consuming to endure. And while we're on that subject, you're timed in each and every stage to complete your operation. Thusly, allow me to go on record by advising that any imprudent sauntering is out of the goddamn question. Upon the loss of your final life, you're offered three continues from the title screen after your recent game over downtime, resulting in starting at square one of the stage within which your ass got lynched. Holy shit, Imperium much? Waste them all, however, and it's back to the fucking beginning for ya! Bottom line, in addition to the warnings I've provided with Final Zone, most of what I discussed here should pretty much sum up my two cents in terms of the adamant, Herculean effort worthy critical survival methods, and then some. In spite of how bespattered, passe, and inclement the graphics are, the overall look does not disappoint by a long shot. The titular Hypertech Cannon Tank, both on the title sequence and in game, is still a sight to behold even to this day. On the latter, mostly the clean, speed varied rotations it makes, the offensive attacks that it performs, and even the temporary armaments it equips itself with. Regarding the extensive diversity of enemies it confronts, running the gamut from diminutive to formidable as all goddamn get out, even putting the Stage 3 boss in Super C to the most irreversible guilt that very few could describe. They don't pull any punches either, nor sadly are they much to write home about. 
The contradistinctive array of foreground landscapes, structural and vehicular designs may not be enough to win any awards, even for the game's age, but every one of them at least has the balls, or cojones, kui, kitama, what have us, to stand out from each other. I mean, as per usual, for fuck's sake, I don't see any reason whatsoever to go on any Christ forsaken further! With the Sergeant Wolf Band at the helm once again, that is the aforementioned Sakuraba and Uno, with the exception of Shiono as usual, based on the original Sharp X68000 soundtrack, the quality of the music scores has been yanked up a notch, thanks to the added heavy percussion in each tune they've churned out. While many might find them all to be the usual mixed bag, or in some cases, trite, innocuous, or lack thereof, the majority of each theme is more than enough to keep you on your toes every step of the goddamn way, and a whole lot more. While the sound effects aren't enough to pop anyone's cherry, they still have an intense enough feel for every challenge the determined commander slash pilot of the titular hypertech tank immerses himself in, most notably the explosions that drown out the percussion. And let's not get ourselves started with the voiceover samples, for example, Ready heard at the start of each stage, and all the weapon names heard upon nabbing them, you know, Reflector, Epaulette, the Chromelech, and even the <coughs> Paul Bunyan. And once more for the last time, take note of my top 8 songs shown here, with 4 honorable mentions at the bottom, starting right about... <laughs> yeah, who wouldn't see that coming, right? Concerning the replayability, there are absolutely no words to epitomize how much I addictively exalt and favor the living hell out of both this and Final Zone, in spite of not catching on as much as the likes of their Genesis peers, let alone the rest of the renovation library, namely Gyrez, Whiprush, Arrow Flash, Ernest Evans, you name it. Everything I've been constantly yammering the fucking hell on and on about both titles, including Granada no less, from the alternate attack schemes and dogfight perseverance practices, to the harrowing yet fairly adequate boss altercations, should be all the more reason to keep diving into both. Oh, and paraphrasing Ferris Bueller, fair so choice. If you have the means, I highly recommend picking up and trying out both titles. Henceforth, my overall presiding final verdict, your levels of mileage and defiance might vary concerning both titles. You might enjoy them, then again you might not. While these quote-unquote war-centric classics each have their sets of cons about which I'm in no position to reiterate, their pros pretty much outweigh the fuck out of them. Therefore, you'd be flat-out non-compass mantis to even contemplate leaving either, or both, Final Zone and Granada out in the blistering ass cold. And while we're at it, the traditional Latin maxim saying applies here, and I quote, De gustibus non est disbuntandum. Translation, there's no accounting for taste. Looking at you, film and stuff. Anyways, until then, this is the one and only Hardcore Retro God proudly signing off.